I'm Julie with the Elite Graduate Program. And welcome to Universal, or I'm sorry, Basic Elements of Universal Design. Today we have Rachel Cox, Director of Disability Services, and Jennifer Weir, Assistive Technology Specialist from Disability Services. Let's give them a round, warm round of applause, please. Good afternoon and thank you for being here. Today I'm going to talk basic elements of universal design. I'm really excited because for the first time we're actually going to be formally trained on universal design here on this campus um, through the Disability Training Network. The Disability Training Network was a, is a grant funded program out of College Station that helps train individuals in the system only on universal design plus other disability related uh, issues. So I'm really excited that that's going to probably start sometime in November. Uh, we've recruited some faculty and we're, gonna, we're looking, we're waiting for the training and for the fine tuning of when, how, where this course is going to be uh, started and completed. So anyway, I'm going to talk about basic elements of universal design. We're Disability Services and we're at Driftwood 101, so if you need to refer a student to us, that's where we're located. I also want to just give you a little idea of who we serve, what type of disabilities we serve here on campus. We serve learning disabled, we serve ADHD, we serve physical, visual, mobility, psychological disabilities, deaf and hard of hearing, and traumatic brain injury, TBI. Which, go ahead. Are you seeing a number of people with um, like post-traumatic stress syndrome? I, that, I, I, I guess that would come under traumatic brain injury. But yes. Okay. Yes, we are seeing more and more. The veterans are coming in. They're still hesitant to come into our offices uh, because of the stigma attached to having a disability and being a veteran. But we're working with closely with uh, Veteran Affairs to try and recruit. Um, well, just get them connected with us. Yeah. Um, which disability do you think we serve the most? Anybody want to guess? Ju Julie? ADHD? Yes, the numbers are going up. ADHD, yeah. It used to be learning disabilities, but most recently, actually we have 28% of our population is ADHD, 18% is learning disabled. 16% is uh, psychological disabilities, and that is also going up. And the reason for that is because individuals with psychiatric disabilities are on medications that manages their disability more, and so therefore they are showing up on our college campuses. What is universal design? Well, it all started with a guy named Ron Mace who uses a wheelchair, and he was an architect. And he wanted to figure out how can I get around buildings, campuses, and still in my wheelchair, you know? And he wasn't able to until we started, he started the concept of universal design. It is a design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without having to change the environment. So can you think of an example of universal design in a building or a sidewalk? Bathrooms, curb cuts, ramps. And it isn't only going to be used by someone in a wheelchair, but look at the different people that do take advantage of that. Even us with our cart coming over here, we didn't have to jump curb cuts to get over here. Universal design has been um, what I'm looking for. Also applied to instruction. Okay, so this is the definition that came out of the University of North Carolina. Is that what you said? Okay. Uh, universal design is an approach to the designed instruction that takes into consideration disabilities, racial and ethnic backgrounds, reading abilities, ages, and characteristics of the student body. What brings to mind for me is learning styles. Everybody learns differently. And so to me, universal design is reaching out to all those people and not just a few. 
These are just as different terms used for universal design and instruction. Okay. The basic elements of universal design. Multiple means of representation, multiple means of engagement, and multiple means of expression. Okay. And I'm going to talk more about each one of these and what that means. Multiple means of representation means providing various ways of acquiring the information and knowledge to students, such as, here are some examples of how we can represent the information to the individuals of different learning styles, different disabilities, different types. Overhead, I think, is not used that often anymore. Overhead, but it was still on the list. I was surprised that it was still on the list. Simulations, PowerPoint presentations, I don't think I've seen a chalkboard in a long time either. Um, here, it's continued. Assignments in written form and posted on the course website. A lot of the professors now, and a lot of professors are doing this now, but not everyone. They post their, um, their lecture notes on the website. Like I said, it, it's not everyone, but it's, it's, it's happening. It's spreading. Study guides. Um, see what else. Multiple means of engagement. How can we en engage the student at their different learning styles or different abilities? Some of the things that we can do is a variety of assignments. I didn't realize this when I was going to school, but I thought, oh my god, I hope they never give me an essay question. But then when they started, <laughs> I started having to take essay exams, Oh, I did better on essays than <laughs> multiple choice. So not everybody can Im express themselves this, at the same level, you know, of whatever that, I'm getting nervous with the camera. <laughs> uh, small group discussions, whole class discussions, lectures, uh, all of these are ways of engaging the individual. Multiple means of expression provides the student or the learner a variety of ways to be able to express what they know, the knowledge that they have. Here are multiple formats that I talked about just a minute ago, essay, short answer, oral, multiple choice. Um, they're going more and more toward web online testing. Um, so that's also available to our students. And what Jennifer can talk about is how we convert some of those exams that can be accessible to all of our students, especially our visually impaired students, and then maybe someone with a reading disorder. Use of a word processor, spell check, grammar check. We're, these can be accommodations if the professor is not testing for, let's say, spelling. Then the student is allowed to use a spell checker. But if they're being measured, what, are, what is the professor measuring? It depends on what they're measuring. If they're measuring for spelling, well, then they cannot use a spell checker. If they're measuring for can I add and subtract, then they can't use the calculator. What universal design is all about is just providing different ways that the learner can express their, their ways of knowledge or their, what they've acquired, the knowledge they've acquired. Everyone benefits from it, not just the one who is really, really smart or the one who uh, has really, really, you know, just studied really hard. Because you can study really hard and still not be able to demonstrate to the professor what you've learned. And I've got a handout for everyone. I'm sorry I didn't give you one. I'll get you one in a minute. Jennifer, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer for the Universal Design and Technology, and you'll be amazed at some of the stuff that she's got to show you. This is the uh, microphone. Yes. Okay. Do you want me to? Oh, you can stop. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, universal design principles in some of the technology that our students might use um, in their um, college life. To backtrack a little bit, though, I just kind of want to give you an overview of um, industrial universal design concepts. Uh, if you look, the faucet on, on the um, side of the screen here is uh, Moen, and Moen is a 
big fan of universal design. Their, um, their motto is um, use it, what is it? Use it for life, something, use it for life. But the whole thing is that form follows function. What does the faucet need to do? How can we make it beautiful and usable by a wide variety of people? Universal design appeals to those who are eight years old and those who are 80 years old. It's usable by eight-year-olds and 80-year-olds. Um, it's, it's usable by people who are larger. It's usable by people who are smaller. It's usable by left-handed people and right-handed people. And it's usable by people with disabilities and people without disabilities. So universal design is not the same as assistive technology. I'm the assistive technology specialist here. As such, I use a lot of devices that are specifically designed for people with disabilities. Or I may adapt devices specifically for a person with a disability. The difference between universal design and assistive technology is that universal design is it's proactive. This is uh, Good Grips. I brought this in from my kitchen um, because uh, I started working in the field of disabilities in 1992, um, very shortly after the American with Disabilities Act was passed. And money was flowing out of, um, of the government uh, for universal design and disability concepts. And Ron Mace, who, um, who Rachel mentioned earlier, was a frequent visitor to our center. Um, we had a center called the Idea Center, where it was part of our industrial design school and our architecture school. And Ed Steinfeld, who calls himself the uh, father of universal design, and Ron Mace worked together on a, a variety of projects there. And at every presentation they did on universal design, they showed these types of handles on utensils. Um, these were developed by an older husband and wife um, who um, the wife was having a hard time using her potato peeler because she, she was getting older, developing arthritis in her hands, and peeling potatoes takes a long time. And she's like, oh, just I just need something a little bigger and more comfortable in my hand. And so, and this was uh, the Farbers were their name. And so they hired, um, uh, a design firm at University of Buffalo um, to design um, these uh, special handles um, for their first product, which was a potato peeler. And it's, it's simple. It's, it's not rocket science. It's a, it's a molded rubber, and it's got a, a little slip-proof grip on it. Um, and they're called Good Grips, and they formed a company called OXO. And the reason for the name OXO was a universal design concept. You can read OXO, O-X-O, you can read it forward, you can read it backwards, you can read it up, and you can read it down. So these took off, and this is, this is universal design. It's comfortable for, for everyone, whether you're small, old, uh, left-handed, right-handed, uh, have a disability, or don't. This would be an example of an assistive device. Um, assistive device is a device for a person with a disability, whether we buy it that way off the shelf or whether we modify a device. This is a pen <clears> that's <throat> just been built up with a piece of foam. So we were reactive. We had a student who has arthritis in his hands, uh, had a difficult time using pens, and we built it up with some foam. So this is now an assistive device, and this is universal design because it does not label someone who uses it as a person with a disability. And uh, some design principles of universal design would be that it's intuitive to use. Um, if you're using symbols like um, colors, like red means stop. So if you're designing buttons, you make the stop button or the off button red. Green means go. Um, the arrow, green means go. The circle, red, like a stop sign, means stop. Simple things like that. So I put a picture of the, um, the iPad Touch on as an example of universal design. Universal design tends to be beautiful, and it has very good style. And Apple has spent a lot of money uh, making sure that their products are useful, intuitive, easy to use, and, and they're just, they're beautiful. They have extremely beautiful, oh, bless your heart. So we have, uh, is this an iPad touch then? All right. 
<laughs> so, I mean, look at it, it's gorgeous. All right, let me get my ugly old dinosaur phone out here. And, because that looks like the, the iPhone, although that's the, that's the touch. Oops, that's yours. We have the same, uh, we have the same one. Am I messing up your video by walking around? <laughs> okay, so let's hold up the touch, which is not an iPhone, but resembles an iPhone. Thin, beautiful, shiny, <laughs> you know? My Blackberry, which is a very poor example of universal design. I do not like the Blackberry because although I am not a large person, I am not a child either, and I cannot use the keyboard on this. The buttons are too close together, and I'm, I'm, I'm constantly making um, butt calls because I'll, I'll put it down and it'll start pushing the buttons and, and I'll, I'll call people on it. And I forgot this is being video recorded. But <laughs> bad example of universal design. Good example of universal design. Uh, one thing that you can't see from up here, and, um, but I'll let you play with the, the iPad and some of the other devices, and, and Julie's going to let you play with the touch as well, is that features of accessibility are already built in to Apple products. So you can zoom. Have you ever seen people doing the pinch where you can zoom in and out? Um, the, the iPad, I'm not sure about this, has voiceover on it, so you can have text spoken to you. You can have the, um, the icons spoken to you as well. You can, it'll flip so you can look at it in portrait or landscape. Let's see. It has, if you're reading text, and you don't know the meaning of a word. You can highlight the word with your finger and it'll come up with the definition of the word. And that, that's just built in, but boy, that is a really good feature for somebody with a learning disability. The Zoom's great features for people with vision impairments. Now, my, my father um, swears he does not need an iPad. Um, and he has a little bit of a difficult time. He's getting older, and um, he, he has a harder time now, although he used to be great with computers before, with the changes in the operating systems and stuff. It takes him longer now to, to figure out how to get around. Picked up the iPad, and he's moving around. And every time he comes over, Jenny, let me, let me play with your iPad for a minute. And then I cannot pry it out of his hands for the night. So. My kids every night fight over who gets to read their books on mom's iPad. My kids nine, my dad 70. So, you know, it's universal design. It reaches a very wide audience. Have you ever seen um, Billy Mays, um, who I guess passed away last year, but he had a, a reality TV show for a while where people were coming up and were pitching their, um, their product ideas for him. Um, he's the guy that has, I guess, what are they, the balls that you put in the dryer and they dry your clothes faster and you, they go in the washer and he's got all these different products. Um, he doesn't have the sham wow, but he's got products like that. OxyClean, OxyClean. yes, OxyClean. And um, he, he's the guy that always yells. He gets on the commercials and, and he yells. And um, the reality show was great while it was on because that was how he determined whether the product got past him and, and started being developed. Was did it appeal to the young and the old? Was it easy for people of all different shapes and sizes to use? Uh, was it intuitive to use? And a lot of his products, he had different reachers and things, a lot of his products were mass marketed um, to the general American public but started out as an assistive device for somebody. And it's, no, this reacher, you know, it's great for getting stuff off of high shelves and down low. So his whole thing was uh, universal design concepts. Okay, the... Okay, so I, I showed you a little bit of, of uh, text on the, um, on the iPad. This is a, uh, 
this is the old iPad. And this is a, uh, an old tablet PC. You can still buy them. They do look very much the same. Um, this was very big uh, in the early 2000s um, with a bunch of universities had purchased these for their incoming freshmen and it was going to be the note taking device. It comes with a keyboard that attaches on it but mostly it's a touch computer. It does run, it's a full computer, it runs Windows XP but it has a recorder in it and they were really marketing this to college students because they could take their notes it does do handwriting recognition. You write on it just like a pad and paper, and then it'll recognize it, and you could record your notes at the same time. And we ended up using, um, well, we always like touch screens when we're working with um, certain disabilities because a touch screen is really easy to manipulate with a lot of different kinds of switches. And we, we've had, um, um, people who had maybe, you know, no use of their hands, um, maybe quadriplegic, but used mouth sticks and things like that. And, and this is great because you can, you can put it at an angle. So if a person's in a wheelchair, they can wheel right up to it. It's got um, different clamps. You can clamp it in. And um, these aren't always attached. We had a, a person that was using this um, as a mouth stick and was writing and his handwriting with his mouth is actually quite, quite good on there. There's an extreme example of a touch screen, um, but um, touch screens have always been very popular like the iPad is. But they're popular with kids too because they're intuitive. You drag things around with your finger. You don't have to you know, make that connection between moving the mouse and moving um, you know, an icon or something up on the screen. So, but this is kind of like the early version of the iPad. I was hoping, and I know Rachel was too, when I got the iPad, that that would have these types of um, handwriting features on it, because I'm a, I'm a paper and pen type person. I always am jotting things down. I don't like to type, type notes in if I'm, if I'm listening to a lecture. Um, the iPad does not have the nice pen size of this. The iPad is writing very big, looks like crayon with your big finger. Well, Rachel bought a stylus. It still comes, it's just, it's thick. And so, so it's, um, Rachel and I both uh, purchased um, Android tablets yesterday, which are available as of today online at walgreens.com for $99. And it's, it's um, Google's, I guess, answer to the iPad. And they come with a stylus. And it looks from the picture, although we haven't received ours yet, that it might be more like this, in which case I'm probably selling the iPad. <laughs> walgreens.com. You're only allowed to order two. And you can only do it online. You don't have, you don't have them at the store. So you your iPad. <laughs> I have a, a phone call in to buy four of them. Okay, I'll let you know. Because, you know, $99, that's, uh, that's very affordable. And, th and that's that, you know, $500 for the low end iPad, it, that hurt me. I, I really wanted it, but it, but it hurt. But $99, that's that price point that people are like, all right, I'll, I'll pay $99 for it, but $500, I don't know. So, okay, getting back to e-text, um, I wanted to show you the touch screen and the iPad because those are um, also marketed heavily as e-text readers. This is, um, this is a Sony reader and um, the um, e-reader the e is really a, a perfect example of universal design um, because it gives you an experience that's like reading a real book um, and you have to try it and it's digital ink and it's on a low glare paper it feels like you're reading a paperback book in fact when I'm reading it sometimes I'm trying to flip the page and I'm like oh no I gotta push the button um, how hard is that button to push because mine is I have a Kindle and it's quite I mean some of the things that I have security problems would have a problem with the push well here you can give it a try it takes quite a bit of push just this one here and 
Yep. And you kind of, oh, okay. I do it with my thumb, okay. not my fingernail. But okay, you do yeah. have to push this it looks down. more of a mechanical. Oh, push. okay. So it's got a real click on it. And do you like your Kindle? I love it, but I think I'm going to get carpal syndrome in one mile from, you know, yeah. from doing what the kids do. <laughs> well, um, it's a perfect example of universal design because you really get that experience of reading, but yet you're able to enlarge the text on it. I don't have the Kindle, but I've heard that the Kindle has a voice output feature. Have Only you tried that? The book you purchase has been promoted that way. That's okay. You can either listen to it or you can hear about it. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, well, um, we actually just, this, this is the first semester um, that we have had students come in with, um, the, the Nook seems to be the most popular, that's the one that Barnes & Noble um, sells. This is the first semester we have had students come in with the Nook, and these students, as part of their accommodations to our office, are getting e-text, um, whether it's because they have a difficult um, time holding a book, or have a hard time um, reading it because of low vision or a hard time reading it because of a reading disorder like dyslexia. Um, we are now able to put the textbooks that we get from our publishers or that we scan um, onto these readers. And um, I'm expecting probably to see more of these because one student in particular, we put all his books on here, and he doesn't have to carry his books back and forth anymore. They're all on here, and um, he—it's—it's a—it's a great—it's um, a great feature for him. It's been very helpful. And I noticed that um, the books that uh, several of the textbooks that we've been getting for our students have already been available from the Barnes and Noble bookstore here as an e-text version. And so I just expect to see that increase. And it's wonderful because they didn't. Barnes & Noble didn't start making e-text to, to serve people with disabilities. They started making e-text to serve the general public. And so it, there's, you know, everybody's getting the e-text now. So it's, it's not, you know, really making the person um, with a reading disorder or whatnot stand out because that, everybody's using that. Now we do use, this is um, a newer device um, and I think you saw this. I don't know if you've seen this one. Um, we sometimes will scan books in and have them, the, the student can have it read out with a computer synthesized voice. But we also get books from uh, an organization called Reading for the Blind and Dyslexic where volunteers are reading the textbook. And um, this is a great device that I'll let you play with. It allows you to go to a specific page in the book. Um, so if you have a reading assignment, you don't have to fast forward through all the audio. You just, you know, go right to the specific page. Um, but this, this is also a recorder for recording lectures, an MP3 player, and um, a daisy reader, and it's got its own speech synthesizer in there. So if you upload um, the professor's syllabus or a, a website, if you upload the text from a website into here, it'll, it'll read it back for you. So it's, it's got um, a lot of universal design features on it. The buttons are easy to see and feel, and they, you know, page, you know, it's got a little icon of a book on here. It's very easy to understand. So this is a good example of universal design. We also have daisy readers that look like a, um, a CD player, and those are great too, except that most of our students are already carrying around MP3 players or iPhones, and they don't want to carry around what to them looks like ancient technology. And so, you know, we switch some of them to this. Some of them will, will upload the book to their, to their iPhones. Um, we've got a method where we can preserve a lot of the navigation on that. And, um, you know, it doesn't label them as having this big, clunky old CD player with them. Workshop and they were talking about technology, not from this point of view, but they told us about iTunes University, which is brand new between iTunes and the state of Texas. Really? It's to put educational stuff, and I don't know exactly what the stuff is because it's brand new, on iTunes where they can download it. Really? I'm not aware so of that. I'm excited to see what's you know, going to be on it, but I guess it's a new partnership. 
Oh, that's great. I'm going to check that out right after this. iTunes University. So it's iTunes U. And it's with Texas, the state of Texas. Yeah, maybe others, but I mean the state of Texas is where I went. That's great. Yeah, I'll definitely check that out. Because they've all downloaded iTunes, and you might as well download educational stuff, too. Um, oh, OK. I, bef before I go to the next screen, um, how much, how are we doing on time? Oh, I have plenty of time. I, I know I ran out of time last time. Um, this is a this is a touch screen computer. We were talking about touch screens with the old tablet PC and with the I, iPod Touch and with the iPad. Um, this is another touch screen. Hopefully, it's going to work for me. Oh no! Come on. There we go. Okay, <laughs> and. Um, this is running Windows 7, and so I brought this because both because the actual computer itself is its universal design. It's all the whole stuff, um, the CDs and all of the computer is actually right in the monitor. And if it just didn't have this stupid plug sticking out of it, I mean, it would it would be perfect. But it's got a wireless keyboard and a wireless mouse, so it's great for our students. Um, you know, in wheelchairs or for our larger students who need to, you know, stretch out and move their keyboards in different areas. It's great for any student who just wants to put his feet up with his keyboard on his lap. Um, it, it, it's, it's just wonderful. And um, the touch screen is, is great for kids. There's some kid games and stuff on here. It's great, again, for those of our students who need some kind of an alternate input. It's great for our students who have it, some of our non-traditional students who are not computer savvy. Um, it's just easier to be able to use your finger to navigate on the screen. But I, I wanted to show it because it's also running Windows 7, which the university is um, switching to on campus. And I know most of the computer labs are still Windows XP, and they're working on switching over to Windows 7, but I know other whole schools have already completed the switch. And I'm a big fan um, of Windows 7 and also of Snow Leopard uh, on the Macintosh because, again, accessibility functions are built in. Now this has a zoom, I see this little magnifier here, where you can magnify things on the screen. We use, it's not the best resolution, you can come up and see it afterwards, I understand um, it, it may be difficult to see without it being on the screen. But we have software that we can put on a computer called Zoom Text that will enlarge the text. However, it's very expensive software and um, it kind of does a number on your computer when you install it. It's, it's very harsh software. And it doesn't always work on things like video. Um, it, it'll, it'll put holes in the video and then it'll crash the computer and you have to restart it. And although Zoom Text has some wonderful features that are not in Windows 7, most of our students who have switched to Windows 7 um, have actually stopped using Zoom Text because it's just easier to click on the magnifier that's there and they appreciate that they don't have to load additional software. Oh, were you in? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. Am I bugging you by moving around so much? Um, and the Macintosh um, also has the pinch zoom built into it. And again, I mean, just. This is not the newest MacBook. I saw the newest one shortly before coming here. One of our students just got it. But they're, they're just beautiful. They're, they're beautiful pieces of design. And it has the voiceover built into it. So um, it, has, it has actually two different kinds of voice output. It has voiceover, which talks, it speaks everything that's on the screen, and then it has text-to-speech, which just speaks what you want it to speak. Like, you would use the text-to-speech if you wanted to highlight a paragraph or a page and have it speak that to you. But again, some of our students who have been using more expensive software um, have, have made the switch because it's, it's built into their operating system and it works pretty well. Well, this is a MacBook, and but the operating system is Snow Leopard, that has the Zoom, 
It's very much like the iPad. See this? The mouse button, it all is one button, but it, you can do like the triple finger tap and the zoom just like you would do on the iPad. There's all these different features that, that I have a list of them of, of you, can, you can do on that and it'll manipulate your screen. And the whole thing is one big button. Took me forever to figure out how to right click when it's one button. <laughs> so. Okay. All right, so um, we like eText. It encompasses universal designs for learning because um, once you get something digital, you're really giving the responsibility to the student to do with it as you will. You can get your book and you can highlight things. You can change the background color. We have one student who, um, who likes things on a yellow background with dark black text because of the high, high contrast and less glare. Um, you can type in notes. You can enlarge the font or change the font. I read something Sunday night that said that learning is actually increased by a more difficult font. <laughs> it was a study saying that if you, if you want to retain something from a difficult textbook, don't make the font Arial, don't make it sans serif. Make it uh, Comic Sans or um, what's it, Bedoni, something with serifs or fancy on it. Because as you're reading it, you're, um, you're concentrating a little more and it's actually the, the retention of what you're reading is sinking in. That's, um, I think it came out Sunday. I, I love these kind of, of, of studies. Um, I don't put my students' books in difficult fonts, so they would not be happy with me. Um, and you can listen to the book. And whether it's through, um, it, it may be through um, a device like this, or it may be through software that's available on campus like Kurzweil, or it may be through the student's uh, own um, um, computer, like using a Mac or the iPad to read it back to them. OK, recorders. I had a. Um, a graduate student in my office today who just went crazy over this device. I'm going to play the video first. Let me get out of your way here. This is a cute video. Oh. There it is. Yep. Okay, so um, we had ordered a few of these and, and made them available to our, our students for loan. Very popular item. Um, as you're writing, you have special paper. It has little dots that form a grid and it's magnetic ink. As you're writing, you can record um, what's being said in the room. So if you go back later, Say you're studying for your final and you want one of the very first lectures. You can go back to your lecture and type on your notes. Oh, I gotta turn it on first. Just kind of tap on it. You probably won't be able to hear it, but we'll let you play with it. So wherever I pushed, I, it was what was being said at the moment where I was writing that. So if I'm in that professor's class and I'm trying to copy down his diagram, um, I'm also getting what he said while, he was, while I was copying it down. So you can go back and hear it. And you can really organize your notes that way. And um, I have heard that um, there are some uh, classes that are the students are using these, all of them together, and they're uploading um, 
their notes to um, like a website that the professor has set up and um, sharing the notes that way. It's special paper and it's special ink that comes inside here. Um, and you can print, there's a special kind of ink you can buy for your inkjet printer that will print this kind of paper out. But when you attach this to your computer, it takes all of your notes and all of the recordings and reproduces it on your computer. So everything I wrote here would go into my computer. It takes a picture of it, it's like a PDF. And the way it does that is because the special paper, it's actually a map, it's got little grids on there so it's, it knows what I've written. It's, it's really cool. <laughs> you buy these at Best Buy. We got them last Christmas. I think they were just under 200. Um, this is not the one you saw on the commercial. This is the version before it. So I'm expecting this one to be fairly inexpensive. We have had a lot of students that have tried it and then gone out and purchased their own. So it's, it's great. We have other recorders available. Oh. I forgot my technology. <laughs> we have other recorders available. I think I have one in my bag. We didn't get everything out here. Yeah. And a, and a recorder, of course, is, is, is helpful for so many students. Um, let's face it, I mean, college is, is difficult. You've got a lot of classes, you've got a lot of information to retain. If the professor allows it, and I would hope most of them do, a recorder is just such a valuable tool for any student. We like this particular kind of recorder because it saves the recordings as an MP3 file. It has good universal design, USB, so you can just transfer it right to your computer. Easy to use buttons, red, circle for stop, green for go, following the concepts of universal design. That concludes um, what I had wanted to talk about, but I would like to invite you to come up and try some of the features of the devices that we have on display for you today and see if you can figure out, you know, universal design features of them. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer and Rachel. And Rachel, could you come up? We would like to thank Hi. you and Jennifer Thank you. for presenting today. Thank you.